your forecast first. Sponsored by Natax Heating, Cooling, and Plumbing. So here we go again with another very pleasant evening across central Illinois tonight with the clear skies a little bit warmer than we've had the last few evenings, uh, but still feeling very comfortable. Upper 60s, Champaign-Effingham, 70 in Springfield. We are giving it all green tomorrow. No issues, lots of sunshine, a little warm. Hopefully the AC is working in your vehicle because we are topping out near 90 degrees. It's going to be a warm one. We'll talk about the humidity returning along with thunderstorm chances when we come back. WCI 3 News starts right now. Now from WCIA 3 News. IDPH will watch the identified health metrics closely to determine when regions have attained them. But as our Target 3 investigation found out, parts of the state were ready to move to Phase 4 weeks ago. Six people were shot over three days in one city, and people there say the community needs to step up. Well, our future is bright. I know that, and I'm so thankful. Part of their church was destroyed in a fire, but they still have plans for this Sunday. You're watching your local news leader. This is WCIA 3 News at 10. And the data is giving us more information about what we ought to be doing. Governor Pritzker has said the data would guide his decisions on when to reopen parts of the state. But the metrics he's using to measure each region show just how different COVID-19 looks in each corner of Illinois. Good evening, I'm Jessica Coons. Our Target 3 investigation found all three regions outside of Chicago already met the governor's data metrics to advance to phase four more than a month ago. WCIA3's Mark Maxwell is in Springfield. We try to use our data and make the most informed decisions. For months, the Illinois Department of Public Health has tracked key data points to monitor and measure the state's fight against COVID-19. We consider our hospitalization data a particularly significant indicator. Before widespread testing was available, the state watched closely to see how many sick people would show up at the hospital. That gave them a real-time sense of where the virus was spreading. According to data obtained under the Freedom of Information Act, the North Central region peaked at 23 admissions per day on May 1st. Southern Illinois peaked at 17, April 27th. Central Illinois peaked at 17 hospitalizations, April 3rd. The northeast corner, including Chicago and the suburbs, skyrocketed nearly 20 times higher, reaching a peak of 444 hospitalizations, April 27th. That gap, combined with growing political pressure, led Governor Pritzker to divide the state up into four regions, allowing each region of the state to advance at its own speed as it met medical benchmarks. But there was one key sticking point. Governor Pritzker's phases are 28 days each, twice as long as New York's 14-day phase. IDPH will watch the identified health metrics closely to determine when regions have attained them. That data now shows every region of the state, except for Chicago, had already met those metrics. When Governor Pritzker said on May 5th, downstate would have to wait 56 days to reach phase four, all three downstate regions had already waited more than 56 days and stayed below those levels the entire time. A region must be at or under a 20% test positivity rate. Southern Illinois nearly reached 16% of people testing positive on April 23rd. The North Central region nearly hit 12% April 22nd. Central Illinois never hit double digits, peaking below 8% on April 2nd. Chicago and the surrounding suburbs were above 20%, more than half of that time, peaking at 28% on April 14th and not reaching the 20% rate until May 11. A region must maintain the availability of a surge threshold of 14% availability of ICU beds, of medical and surgery beds, and ventilators. Even counting the surge that hit Chicago, after Governor Pritzker's order to stay home, hospitals there never reached that dangerous point where only 14% of ICU beds or medical and surgery beds were available. In fact, hospitals in all three downstate regions haven't come anywhere close to that mark, staying comfortably above 30% availability in bed space and ventilators. You know, I'm not saying that we couldn't have made other decisions along the way and that everything was perfect. Those numbers we obtained ended more than two weeks ago. And in the two weeks since, Illinois has reported the fastest decreasing number of new coronavirus cases and hospitalizations per day. Both good signs, both also amplifying calls around the state for Governor Pritzker to reopen the economy that much sooner. But on Monday, asked about that in Belleville, the governor said he plans to stick with his plan, including a 28-day timeline. That means we enter phase four at the earliest one week from Friday. 
Reporting in Springfield, Mark Maxwell. In a statement, Governor Pritzker's office pointed to other states like Arizona, Texas, and Missouri that relaxed restrictions sooner and are now showing a spike in cases. Now, Phase 4 is on track to start at the end of next week, as you heard. One of the changes in Phase 4 means that restaurants will be able to serve people inside with limited capacity. Of course, under Phase 3, they've only been able to serve people outside. We spoke with the Vermilion County Health Department today, and they say they think their area is ready to start Phase 4. Certainly, yeah. If the if, if the if the indications we're looking at the um, the measurements that the states use and make its decisions clearly show we're moving in a good direction. We're seeing more people getting tested, but our positivity rate is staying at a very reasonable at a low rate. Big events will still be restricted in Phase 4. As we've told you, the governor announced the cancellation of both state fairs this summer. Researchers at the U of I have developed a saliva test for COVID-19. With this process, they can test over 10,000 people a day. It can be done without health care workers and helps to minimize the use of PPE. They plan to have 16 stations on campus where samples can be taken. The school has not yet made any official plans on students returning for the fall semester. The the Champaign School District is still working on plans for the fall, and today they sent parents the three possible scenarios of how that could happen. The first would be a full return to classes under guidance from the governor, public health, and the Board of Education. Number two would be a combination of returning but with some remote learning, and the third option would be all students learning from home. The district has created several groups that will present a plan in mid-July. State officials say there are 546 new coronavirus cases in Illinois today. We've now had more than 134,000 total. 87 more people have died for a total of nearly 6,500 deaths across the state. A Decatur man was flown to a Springfield hospital after police say he was shot in the stomach. This happened at East Olive and Lober Streets early this morning. Officers interviewed neighbors at the scene and one woman says the gunshots woke her up. It was like five or six shots. It sounded like it was right outside my bedroom window. I'm just concern for the children out here. We don't need any more lives taken over this gun violence. It's just sad. And now we've got a kid that's could be not survived this one. Yeah. We spoke with another family in the area who say they slept through everything, but they did have a bullet go through their home. People in one central Illinois city are asking for change after six people were shot there in just a few days' time. Danville police are investigating five shootings. Of the six people hurt, two were serious. Now community leaders say they're frustrated because they felt they were making progress in the fight against gun violence, and they want everyone to take part in the effort to stop it. Being passive, being silent is never the answer. You know, going to social media and criticizing your community, in my opinion, is never the answer. But rising up and saying, how can we make a difference? Police can't say if they're investigating those shootings as connected. There have been 30 shootings so far this year in Danville. And tonight we have a follow-up on another story from Danville. I'm not going to do anything with you. I just need to find out what's going on there. We told you yesterday about a new training program in Danville for future police officers. It'll be used to train DAX criminal justice students, but right now Danville officers are testing it. And today they gave a first-hand look at how it works. The system, called Milo, runs through scenarios for officers, and it gives them different outcomes depending on how they respond. And the more we run them through scenarios, whether it's real life or in, you know, computer generated uh, scenarios, they're picking up on different experiences as well as they're starting to understand what the different things that they may need to work on. The police chief says he knows the training is not perfect, but says it's a great way to help officers build confidence. Members at one church are uniting more than ever as they try to salvage parts of their sanctuary that were destroyed in a fire. It happened yesterday at Clinton Assembly of God. The pastor says he has high hopes for the congregation's future moving forward. WCIA3's Jennifer Jensen has more. Charred edges of old photos mark the remnants of a fire that burned this church sanctuary to the ground. These pictures were found in the rubble. They hold even more meaning now. They capture moments of the church sanctuary groundbreaking decades ago. This is what it looks like now. 
this is devastating to me and it's sad and it's hard to deal with. Longtime church member Tina Turley was dedicated here as a baby. Firefighters were able to stop the flames from spreading to other parts of the church. Last week was the first time in months the church had gathered for service. This is just a building. We've not been in our building. We had one service back because of the quarantine, and so we know we're not dependent upon a building. Pastor Nick Blackledge says despite what happened, they will have service this Sunday. We're going to have a service in our front yard in front of all the wreckage and everything. We're going to hold a service, and so looking forward to worshiping with my church family. And looking into the future, church members are holding on to hope that this will only help them become stronger. We will step out of this and become something bigger and better. So I do look forward to that. The church plans to clean out the other part of the building and once the smoke is cleared, they'll open that up to hold services while they begin to rebuild the main sanctuary. Other churches have offered up their buildings as space for this church to hold services in the meantime. Reporting in Clinton, I'm Jennifer Jensen, WCIA 3, your local news leader. The cause of that fire is still being investigated. The Clinton Fire Commissioner says they don't think there was anything suspicious about how it started. Moving into a new home can be stressful for foster children. How one group is trying to make it easier. Plus, kids are getting help thanks to two organizations, but those groups have another company to thank for it. And later, getting the IHSA Boys Basketball tourna Tournament back to Champaign is good for the city. Why Illini coach Brad Underwood says it's also good for their basketball program. Program.